evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. My name is Wayne Dennison. I'm a uh, board member of Wabash Valley Riverscape, and we're pleased to be sponsoring the speaker series. Uh, we're also sponsoring the Smithsonian exhibit, which is currently at the Vigo County School Corp Administrative Office here in West Terre Haute. And along with that, we have a uh, companion exhibit called the Pearls of the Wabash. If you haven't had a chance to go see the exhibits, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, the speaker series, we're really pleased to uh, be sponsoring. This is the last week of the, we'll have speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Mike Kukrell tonight. He is an associate professor of geography at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. I'm proud to say Mike is a colleague of mine. We've, uh, Thank you. Mike has been at uh, Rose Holman quite a bit longer than I have. Uh, I've been with Riverscape for a year. I know um, one evening I was here and uh, Ken Harris was doing the introduction. He had mentioned that he had been with Riverscape for 12 years and had seen all the great things that have happened. But we've really had an exciting year this past year with uh, everything that's going on. We had uh, a wonderful Moonlight on the Wabash dinner one evening back in the fall. We've opened up the connector from uh, Terre Haute over to West Terre Haute. And, uh, a lot of work done with the trail system and just a lot of really remarkable things that I think Riverscape's doing. But Mike is uh, going to give a presentation tonight. We're really glad to have him. So please join me in welcoming Mike Kukrell. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's nice to be at the West Terre Haute Public Library, it's something different for me. And uh, this series, I think, is important because local geography, local history uh, is something that we all uh, cherish and should know more about, usually, than we do. And uh, my talk, if you will, I called it Always a River, and it is really about the Midwest because when we're Midwesterners, there's always a river in our life somewhere, one river or another. And I'm a little bit like the Wabash River. I started on a farm in Ohio and I'm passing through Terre Haute for a while. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my background. And uh, if you know about uh, the Wabash River, hopefully you'll learn a little more about it tonight. But many of you probably know more than I do about the Wabash. And I heard last night you had a wonderful presentation about the Miami Indians, native peoples to the area and others. And I had some things on that, but I'll, I cut that out a little bit today. We're gonna to talk about some other things. But most of us were raised around a river somewhere. And uh, how many people had a river in their childhood that was near their home somewhere? See, almost everybody in here. Maybe it was a small creek, maybe it was a big river. Uh, maybe it was the Ohio River or maybe the Mississippi, but rivers are all part of our lives and sometimes we experience different rivers as we move around and live in different towns, different cities. Most of our cities and towns of the Midwest, the larger ones, are on rivers. Rivers were necessary for industry, for transportation, for population, um, for, for dumping things into <laughs> as well. Uh, the river I grew up on was called the Crooked River by the native people of the area. Um, anyone know that river? The Crooked River? You might know it better by a more infamous name, the Cuyahoga. And the Cuyahoga River is one of the ones that really maybe does not have the best reputation because it was known as the river that caught on fire and burned in 1969. And that was one of the big issues or big wake-up calls of the environmental movement in the United States that our rivers are so polluted that they catch on fire and burn. We used to swim in the Cuyahoga when I was a kid. We lived way up river, you know, before it went through Akron and Cleveland and got really polluted. We lived way up river. My grandparents had a farm, which is now part of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park System, uh, the only national park in Ohio, by the way and they wanted to save the river and the valley from further destruction, from industrialization. And I can say it's much cleaner now, the Cuyahoga, than when I was a kid. But uh, yeah, sort of a notorious reputation. In life though, I lived on other rivers. Later I lived on the Hocking River. 
And the Hocking River, you may or may not know, but it's also like the Wabash, a tributary of the Ohio, and a northern tributary. There's the southern tributaries that come up to the Ohio. There's the northern tributaries that flow southward, and the Wabash is the largest of the northern tributaries going into the Ohio River. The Hocking River is over in southeast Ohio, um, not far from the Muskingum River, which is a larger river. But the Hocking River also is home to my undergraduate university. And the river went right through Athens, Ohio, uh, at Ohio University. Now, when uh, Ohio University was founded, and this ties into the Wabash here, when Ohio University was founded, and I'm not talking about Ohio State and Columbus, that's a different school, uh, Ohio University was founded as American Western University in 1802. And that was the West. This was the great Northwest right here. This was the Northwest Territory from the colonial states. Okay, this is where American culture really began. Before we got to Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, we were living in a colonial world, colonial British America, but American culture really began here with the Northwest Territory. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit. So I lived on the Hocking River and the Hocking River flooded campus. That was a big problem right there. So we were well aware of the river in our college town because it reminded us every spring of the power of nature and the ability to flood campus directly. Um, the river was moved actually by the Army Corps of Engineers so it no longer flows through town. Uh, that can be done too. It's always not the best idea in the long term and uh, there's some new problems with it today. Anyhow, that's the second river in my life, a tributary like Wa the Wabash into the Ohio. The third river is a little more interesting, a little more international, and you may or may not know it. Uh, in its native language, it was called the Voltava River. In the German language, it's called the Moldau. You may know the piece of music, the Moldau, about a river, and rivers adapt pretty well to music, to songs. Uh, but I lived in Prague in the Czech Republic for a year as a graduate student. I was a Fulbright scholar over there when it was still Czechoslovakia. And through the middle of the city of Prague is the Voltava River, or what the Germans called the Moldau. Um, I made many trips to Vienna, and of course everybody knows the river going through Vienna, Austria, the beautiful blue Danube. Again, music associated with rivers. I could give a whole talk on that from the Swanee River to the Ohio River to the Wabash River. There are so many songs and music about rivers. I think that's a great topic for somebody to do. Okay, music has always been a hobby of mine. Uh, I'm a geography professor. Like you heard, I'm at Rose Hallman. Uh, this is my 30th year as a geography professor. It's also my last one. I'm retiring after this year. Um, gonna do some other things. I wanna do some other things yet before I get too old and decrepit, right? Um, I started this morning with a program at 7.30. This is my fifth lecture today. This is the busiest day I have this year. Hopefully I don't have more days like this, but uh, <laughs> I had three classes, full classes, and then I did a program on our international programs at Rose Hallman at uh, 5.30 today, and then I drove over here and drank some coffee and uh, I have this one. I have a doctor's appointment in the morning. I'm supposed to fast tonight. Uh, not good planning, not good planning here for me. Um, anyhow, let's, let's talk about rivers a little bit and the importance of rivers in civilization. Because how do we define civilization? There's lots of different definitions of civilization, you could say, but a lot has to do with the settlement of land, the settlement of territory, and uh, the development of towns and cities and industry and occupations and agriculture and rivers play a big part of that. If we go back, oh, about 10,000 years ago, if you can think back to 10,000 years ago, long before ancient Egypt existed, long before the Roman Empire, but go back around 10,000 years ago, humans, human civilization was changing rapidly. It was the age for much of the world, the Neolithic revolution was happening. Neolithic, the new stone tools. Neo and lithic, that's where we get the term. New stone tools, but much of what was going on was settlements for the first time of human beings around rivers. Because before this period, most humans were hunters and gatherers. And they moved with the seasons, they moved with the crops, they moved with the animals they needed. 
and they didn't stay in one place. About 10,000 years ago, they started staying put. They started staying around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and what we know as the land between the rivers, Mesopotamia from the Greek. They started settling around the Indus Valley in what is today Pakistan, and the Indus Valley, the name Indus, uh, actually we have the origins of Indiana and a long complex etymology there going back to Indian and India and Hindu and Indus. Uh, but the Indus Valley was settled around the same time. Also the Nile Valley was settled around the same time, around 10,000 years ago. And the Huang River in China that we know as the Yellow River also saw the first settlements. Well, what happened when people stayed in place? Well, they stayed in place because they domesticated livestock and they domesticated crops. Um, they learned to collect the seeds and plant the seeds and stay in place. Before that, humans moved around a bit. Now, when they stayed in place and they needed these rivers for irrigation, that was the big thing. They needed the rivers when there was drought, when there was uh, seasons without enough rain, uh, and they used irrigation systems from the rivers. And they formed our first urbanized areas and in the West, at least, they formed our first, oh, states when you think about it. Well, you look at the Hittites and the Sumerians and all these ancient peoples uh, leading up to the Egyptian empire that gave us writing, the Phoenicians and others, because they had to stay put and they had to watch their land that they were planting things on. And so they had to guard the land and they had to have rules. Whose land is this? They had to have some form of governance. They had to have some policing force. They had to have some military to protect their land and they had to have people in charge. It's the beginning of urbanization. It's the beginning of state building around eight to 10,000 years ago. And it all happened around the great river systems on the earth. All around the, oh, what is that? About the 20 degrees north latitude across the world, it seems like, where most of this happened. Maybe 30 degrees north latitude. I'd have to look at a map again. So we have rivers being important in the history of, of Western civilization, the beginnings of Western civilization. These civilizations were often called hydraulic or riverine civilizations that utilized the rivers for settlement, city building, state building, empire building. It gave people time to develop more other pursuits like writing and technology, the development of agriculture. All these things happened around rivers. Okay, and the U.S. is no different. Maybe you've been to Cahokia. Uh, so the U.S. is no different. The rivers were important, not only for all the things I previously mentioned, but especially for what? Transportation. It was the transportation. It was the method to get through the land before there was roads, uh, before roads were reliable, before other means of transportation like the railroad came about in Indiana especially, the rivers were the means to get places, to move people, to settle people on the land. So we can go back 10,000 years with the Tigris and Euphrates and all these other rivers and look at these great civilizations that began, that led to us today. And we can move a little closer to home and think about um, the opening up of the West after the 13 colonies. Okay, I don't have to lecture you guys on American history. I think everybody knows enough about that. But after the 13 colonies, after we be, became independent, this was the Western land. And, and the, open, the, the path into the West was the Ohio River. The Ohio River forms where? What city? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh yes. The Monongahela. And what else? The Allegheny come together at Pittsburgh, at Fort Pitt. That was a little fort over there, Fort Pitt, Pittsburgh, and forms the Great Ohio River. And then the Ohio River is going to head south a little bit. Remember, before we had states formed, and it's going to head west and end at the town of Cairo, or Cairo, I think it's pronounced, Illinois, right? Uh, so that's where the Ohio River ends when it joins into the Mississippi. That was the way to the West before roads were created. When pioneers in the 1780s, 1790s started to open up, move into the new Northwest Territory, they left from Pittsburgh and they left by flatboat from Pittsburgh and they came down the Ohio. 
And down the Ohio, they made settlements, different spots, different locations that looked good to them. They brought surveyors with them to lay out the land, to lay out towns, and they continued up some of the tributaries. And one of the, well, the largest tributary on the Ohio to the north is the Wabash River. And people came up the Wabash and founded some of the early towns like Vincennes, as you know, okay, coming this way by flatboat. And if you don't know about traveling by flat boat, it was a, a slow moving boat, uh, often uh, with oars and big paddles. It wasn't propelled by any type of other power. Oftentimes people pushed from the banks and pushed into the shallow river uh, areas. The Ohio is about 20 feet deep, uh, except in certain spots, there's some deeper spots, but a lot of it's around 20 to 30 feet deep. Uh, you can move, move towards the shores a little bit, it's going to be shallower. And then, of course, uh, dry seasons, it's very shallow sometimes, the Ohio. And it was a place that flooded quite a bit as well. So anyways, from the, um, from the Ohio at Fort Pitt, people came by flat boat. And if you want to read a really good book, a recent book on this, and here's a nice illustration on the cover of a flat boat. I could even pass this around if you want by David McCullough, who's one of our great historians of American history. Uh, this is his most recent book, and I believe he's uh, in his 80s now, McCullough, and uh, this is about, it's called The Pioneers, the heroic story of the settlers who brought the American ideal west. And it's all about the settlement of the Northwest Territory and the people that came down from Pittsburgh and settled this part of the country and the ideals they brought with them which is pretty important for spreading American culture and values into Indiana and other states as well. So um, if you want to learn some of the river geography, the largest tributaries by discharge into the Ohio River are the Wabash from the north is the largest, and then the Tennessee River is next, and the Cumberland River from the south. The largest drainage basin that goes into the Ohio River is the Wabash Drainage Basin. So there's a lot of water here. It goes all the way, as everybody knows, across Indiana, the Wabash. And all the drainage in Indiana, just about, about 80%, goes into the Ohio River through the Wabash. Okay. What about way up north? Some goes into the Great Lakes, but not that much here in Indiana as far as drainage basins. Okay. And by length, the Wabash is number three as far as the tributaries going into the Ohio, as far as length. Rivers are hard to measure. You know, what is the longest river? When, I, when my students tell me, oh, this says this is the longest river in the world, I said, don't believe that. <laughs> or they say, this, this is the highest mountain in the Appalachians. I said, How? they don't know that. I said, you know, it's, when, whenever you use those absolutes, this is the longest river, this is the highest hill over here, I always say, yeah, somebody thought it was that way, but maybe, maybe not, okay? Uh, anyway, so the Wabash is pretty important. As settlers came down the Ohio River, they came from two directions, especially into Indiana. Um, I'll talk about a couple of different groups here because they're very different, the people who settled two areas of the Northwest Territory. The Northwest Territory, by the way, and the Ordinance of the Northwest Territory, 1787, is one of the most important documents in American history. There's a lot of things that created American society from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Uh, what were three of the major points of the Northwest Ordinance that was different than the colonial states? You know, our 13 colonies, uh, a lot of people don't realize slavery was in all the colonies. It wasn't just in the southern states. Slaves were in Vermont and, and Boston and New York, and slavery was throughout the colonies. A lot of people don't realize. I know my students don't. They're surprised to hear that when I talk about that. But the Northwest Ordinance, one of the main major points of it was that there shall not be any slavery in this part of the United States, in the Northwest Territories. Not in Ohio, not in Indiana, not in Illinois, not in Wisconsin. It would be a place where no one can be in servitude or, as, or enslaved. And that was the first part of the U.S. to be this way, okay? It was the first part of the, that's important. A second major point is public education would be free. Everybody deserves public education. That wasn't true in colonial America. Uh, yes, yeah, some places here and there, 
but the churches ran the schools, you paid for school, the government did not uh, fund public universities or public schools, but the Northwest Ordinance says we're gonna have public schools and we're gonna survey the land in the Northwest, in Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, and we're gonna survey the land and leave certain townships and certain tracts of land for public education specifically. Thomas Jefferson, what did he come up with with the survey system? I think, I think most of you know that, but Thomas Jefferson, you know, he was a great scholar of many things. You know, um, he was a real Renaissance guy. He, he had his hand in everything, uh, from winemaking to all kinds of stuff he was interested in, Thomas Jefferson. He was also interested in naming the new states as they were created. He, wanted, he drew some maps and said, here's what we're gonna call all these new places. And they were pretty ridiculous names. It's a good <laughs> thing we didn't use them. If you've ever seen the names he came up with, Kentucky, would have, the whole state would have been Transylvania. If we, if we went by uh, Jefferson. Of course, there's Transylvania University in Lexington. Uh, that's where I went to graduate school, Lexington. So I know like, uh, the city in the UK pretty well. That was my graduate school. Um, and I lived right by Transy. That was right down the street from where I rented a house. But uh, I think this area had a, about a six syllable name, according to Jefferson. But we didn't use his names. But we did use his survey system. And the survey system that started in the Northwest Territory was a rectangular survey system, rectilinear survey system of townships and ranges that all the land would be surveyed before it was settled and everything would be at right angles. So you had six by six mile townships in Indiana. My hometown in Ohio is five by five miles. That's what they started with. And then they said, that's not, it doesn't work mathematically real well. Five by five miles does not work. So if you're up in Northeast Ohio towards Pennsylvania, that area, the townships are five by five miles, but the whole rest of the country, all the way to the coast of California, six by six mile townships, the whole rest of the country. And you can divide up those townships then into ranges and you can divide those up into acreage. And when we have 360 acres, that was a pretty good sized farm, but that was a pretty standard sized farm as well and 180 acre farm and, and it was a good way to divide up the land. And so this is known as um, antecedent survey system, meaning that the land was surveyed before it was settled. So the land was surveyed and Jefferson and other people in the government felt the best way to protect the land was to give it to people. If people are living on the land, well, they're gonna get rid of the native people around there. They don't want them on their land and they're gonna protect it from attack and everything else. That's the best way to secure the Western United States was to give land to people and put them on the land. Okay, and one of the persons involved with that quite a bit was a man known as Jefferson's Hammer. And Jefferson's hammer was William Henry Harrison, who lived here at Grouseland, the oldest, I believe it's the oldest house in Indiana, uh, down here in Vincennes. You can visit his home still, 1808, I think it was built, long before he was president for a month. Um, and it's an amazing, if you haven't been to Grouseland, you should visit. It's, it's, it's a nice historic home to visit, um, to see a house. I take international students down there sometimes that are at Rose Hallman who want to see a little bit about local history. And I said, well, let's make a trip down to Vincennes. It's not too far. And they learn about uh, Tecumseh. They learn about William Henry Harrison. They learn about Clark and all kinds of different things in American history, something close by. Unfortunately, we don't have as much in Terre Haute to see. We've lost some of that. Uh, Old Fort Harrison, places like that. We don't have as much here, but Vincennes is pretty good. Uh, another nice trip, of course, is going down to New Harmony and talking about the settlement of New Harmony and the history of that area as well. Um, my brother-in-law's family were the original settlers of Madison, Indiana. And so if you know about Madison, Indiana, which is a beautiful little town, uh, his family, the Buchanans, were some of the first ones there. And there was even a Fort Buchanan that they built. And that's my brother-in-law's family. And he only learned this last year. <laughs> He was adopted at birth, never knew his birth parents, was told they lived in Michigan, uh, on the internet, doing a DNA study, had his DNA checked on Ancestry, something popped up. My brother-in-law is 72 years old. Something popped up and says, you have a match, and it said 100% match DNA 
this woman is your mother. Now he's 72 years old and he met his birth mother for the first time. Yeah, in Madison, Indiana. And found out he had all this family history, six brothers and sisters. They all welcomed him into the family so much. And uh, that was an unbelievable experience for him. Unbelievable. So he has a connection to Indiana. He always thought his family was all from Michigan. That's what his adopted parents told him. But anyway, so I see my sister and brother-in-law a lot more often now. <laughs> they make trips down here uh, to visit his new family. So that's a lot of fun. Anyhow, when people came down the Ohio River by flatboat, there were two groups from different areas in general that settled and came up the Wabash and that settled other parts of tributaries off the Ohio. Okay, the first group I'll mention because I'm, I'm, it's not directly about the Wabash, but it's about the Northwest Territory and I think it's important. Uh, the first group that settled as you came out of Pittsburgh, they were New Englanders. They were New Englanders mostly from Boston, Connecticut, and Vermont. And they bought land in what they called the Ohio Company Purchase. And that was Southeastern Ohio, which, what's the big city of Southeastern Ohio? That's Southwestern Columbus. Ohio. Columbus is in the middle of the state. Portsmouth. Portsmouth's in the due south. There isn't one. There isn't one. <laughs> so, so, Southeast Ohio is Appalachian Ohio. It's coal mines and poverty. You know, Southeast Ohio, the biggest town there is Marietta. Marietta is the river town down there, and it's a, it's a nice old river town, but there's not a whole lot in Southeast Ohio as far as big cities. Um, John Glenn is from the area. General Sherman is from the area. Um, McClellan, several other Civil War generals were from Southeast Ohio. But my point is when these people came by flatboat out of New England and they decided to settle where the Muskingum tributary hit the Ohio River, um, they formed a new America in a way, but they brought New England values with them of abolition, of different religions maybe, different branches of Christianity than you would see here, because I'll get to the Wabash in a second. But they created a little bit of New England, you could say, down around Marietta, Ohio, and the other towns there. Um, the northernmost point there would be Zanesville, probably. And you might know Zanes Trace and, and some of the early roads that came through here. Well, the National Road came through Zanesville, Ohio, too. but. Anyways, Marietta was the first settlement on the river by people out of uh, New England, and they also established a school, and that was Ohio University. Reverend Manasseh Cutler, though, he's the person we can really say is why slavery was not here in Indiana. Because Manasseh Cutler, he was a minister out of Boston, and he spent about six months lobbying, petitioning Congress to make this a slave-free territory because it was going to be a slave territory just like the rest of the United States. And he had strong feelings against that. He was in his 60s already. And he was in the Congress every day arguing with them saying, no, this Northwest Territory, it's gonna be free territory. It's not gonna be slave territory. And most politicians were against him. But he was, I guess he was a real fighter. And he wanted that to be so. And he pushed it through and got that through. And so in many ways, the Ohio River was an extension of the Mason-Dixon line then. As we have the Mason-Dixon line separating the North and South, the free states and the slave states, uh, the Ohio River became a tributary. Thus, the Wabash River became one of the great gateways of what? The Underground Railroad, the movement to the North for freedom uh, of enslaved people from the South. Okay, so this all happened because of previous events like that. So Cutler, you know, he formed his settlements down there in southeast Ohio. Uh, today it'd be Marietta and the Muskingum River and that, that zone down there. Founded Ohio University along with a man named Putnam, who you probably know that name around here, Putnam, because he, a uh, big family of the Putnam family. There were several Putnams and generals in the Revolutionary War. Putnam County over here is named after his father. Uh, Rufus Putnam was an early surveyor in Ohio. This Putnam County here is named after his father, I learned. I had to do a little research on that one. Um, but anyways, 
So this group of settlers were New Englanders in the Northwest Territory. And the next group, though, that came up the Wabash, they were not from New England. They mostly came up the Kentucky River. And the people coming up the Kentucky River, a lot of times they were called butternuts for one reason or another. I don't know where that came from, but I read that. Uh, they were called butternuts. We have butternut trees around here, if you know butternut trees. I don't see them so much anymore. But I used to like to pick butternuts on my grandfather's farm. They had a tree right in the pasture, and they were pretty good to eat, butternuts. Uh, but they were called butternuts, and they came up the Kentucky River, and most of these settlers came from the states of Kentucky, Virginia, and North Carolina. So maybe they had different ideals than the New Englanders that settled Southeast Ohio. Um, as they came here and came up the Wabash River, of course, some of the first settlements, we look at the names though of settlements. What are these names that we have here? They're French names, mostly. So we can go back, oh, 150 years before the first settlements, and we look at the people who were explorers here. And I think everybody knows about the early exploration by the French, by La Salle and others that were here. And they came up the Mississippi and they came up the tributaries and they named things after all the French kings and others from Louisville, St. Louis, uh, Terhaut, uh, Vincennes. Uh, we can go, Evansville, I'm not sure where that came from. I don't, I don't, I don't know who Evans was. Um, that's something I have to research a little bit more. But you have these French names, and my students often ask me about that, who are from out of state and other places. They go, how come there's all these French names around here? I said, there's not so many, but there are some significant ones on the river, and those were the early explorers and traders and trappers, and those were the first white people to settle here, but they were not, they were not like the official settlers. They were not the permanent settlers who came to, to purchase land or to create communities. So a lot of our settlement up the Wabash were people that came out of Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and they came up the Kentucky, came up the Kentucky River, which is a river you don't hear a lot about, by the way, for some reason. You don't hear about the, the uh, Kentucky River as much as other rivers. Um, but anyways, uh, the point is, there is a little different uh, attitude the people that came here because they came out of this uh, the northern tier of southern states the early settlers that came into the Wabash that's not to say there were some New England here Englanders here as well that settled in the early years and some of the early religious communities I mentioned New Harmony New Harmony a lot of people look at as as the first one of the first settlements here of significance because about 800 settlers came to found Harmony, as it was called. It wasn't called New Harmony yet. And they came out of New England and Pennsylvania to form a new religious community, a utopian community they called Harmony. Um, I'd have to read a whole lot more about it. I'm no authority on that one, so uh, some of you may be, but that's not my area right there. I know that it failed, or at least people gave up on it, Harmony, and they left. They went back home, including their leader, and then another group came, and the next group that came, they renamed it New Harmony. And they tried again. And they tried to create a community, a utopian community. And, and we had a lot of utopian communities in the 1820s, 1830s, all over this land. It wasn't just here. There was a whole bunch of those in Southern Ohio, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, especially because they came down the rivers and up the tributaries. Why didn't they come across the land? There weren't any roads of any means. I mean, people came by ox cart across the land, and that was pretty tough going. You could only go so fast. You usually walked in front of the ox, but what kind of roads were there? What kind of paths were there? There was Buffalo Trace, right? Animal paths. Yeah, animal paths. Buffalo Trace was one of the first ones around here that people know. Animal paths. And animal paths are very interesting because in geography, we learned that they follow a climate change sometimes where climates are different because the animals would migrate south for a while because it's too cold at the season and as soon as they got where it's warmer they started going east or west somewhere so you have a line that they made where we see different climates sometimes uh, so the paths the animals made yeah and of course the native peoples use these same paths as well the native people though we don't see as big travelers um, as much as some others, okay? Um, 
they weren't they weren't road builders either very much and they traveled by water whenever they could water was the main way to travel water is the easiest way to travel you get in a boat you get in a canoe you get on a raft you get on a steamship which was first seen on the ohio and wabash as early as 1812 1811 1812 that's pretty early we usually hear about the steamship with robert fulton about 1820 but from what I've read, there was a, a working steamship here on the Wabash, on the confluence of the Wabash and the Ohio around 1811. So again, one of those topics that you read about and you say, hmm, I have to do a little more research on that one. That's interesting. Um, but anyways, what about road building? Well, we know the animal trails that opened up the land to settlement. People came by oxen cart, people came by horse, and people walked more than you think. People walked a lot in those days. Uh, one of the early settlers in my hometown, he was in the Revolutionary War, and uh, Elijah Welton. Interesting story with Elijah Welton. He walked from Connecticut to Ohio when he was an old man. He was uh, pushing 80, and he walked there with his family. What's he going to do, stay behind? And, and they walked from Connecticut into the Ohio country, and he settled there. And when I was in high school I had a summer job and I used to mow the lawn in the cemetery the old cemeteries I mowed the lawn I picked up sticks I filled in graves that were falling in all kinds of fun jobs in the old cemetery well there was a gravestone that was always falling over you couldn't read it but there was a flag always stuck there an American flag because it was a veteran and so I turned the stone over I undug it out of the dirt and Elijah Welton's name was on it. he died in 1820 and uh, at the age of 85 or something. And I thought, well, the Welton Farm, I knew the Welton Farm is right down the road. My grandfather's farm was down here. The Welton Farm was over here. Uh, we knew all the old farm families. When my mom graduated from high school, there were only 24 people in the high school. So that's what kind of town it was. It was a lot bigger when I graduated. And the farms are all gone now, unfortunately. Uh, it's part of its national park. And uh, anyways, Elijah Welton, I thought, well, who was this man? Why does he get a flag? He was in the Revolutionary War. But the thing I found out about him, he was George Washington's carriage driver. And I found, did the research and found that out. He was the personal carriage driver of General George Washington, was Elijah Welton, because he lost his leg to a cannonball, and he was a captain, and he became George Washington's private carriage driver. I thought, wow, nobody in my hometown knows that one. And I got a lot of publicity for finding that out. And there's a big historic monument there now. Because every town wants a personal collect connection to George Washington, right? <laughs> no matter how it is. And I think that my point with that, with the Wabash River, is that we also had a lot of Revolutionary War veterans that settled here, that were given land, that got tracts of land as veterans, and we have um, I think about the third largest group of Revolutionary War veterans and officers who had land in this area of the Northwest Territory. The first largest group closest to the east would be in Ohio. The second or third largest group of war veterans are buried around the Wabash River. Uh, some of those cemeteries are gone, some of those are lost, but we did have a lot of Revolutionary War veterans who came here as older men in the mo in most cases in the 1820s yes there's a very active uh dar group in town a oh. friend of mine is researching her relative and it is strenuous what they go through to prove that they are connected to a revolutionary war person Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know. That. We usually think about the Revolutionary War as something more in, in the East, in New England, in the colonial states, but a lot of those veterans came right here. And of course, as everybody knows, uh, the people of the Wabash Valley were very significant in all the wars, especially the Civil War. Uh, people were very active, and a lot of we had a lot of people in the Civil War from here. The War of 1812, we had some of the major figures in that, like William Henry Harrison, uh, who lived here at the time. So. We can't say we're without connections to American history, to American early history quite a bit. Anyways, uh, New Harmony, the settlements, and then what happened to the Wabash River as the major gateway into Indiana, because this part of Indiana was settled before the North 
before northern Indiana because this was the path in. They didn't come down the Great Lakes. They didn't come across the Great Lakes to settle Indiana, but they came down the Ohio and up the Wabash River. So Vincennes, a few other places are some of our oldest towns that we have here. You would think it would be maybe in the north. You would think it would be somewhere uh, maybe uh, towards the Great Lakes, but it's not, it's really down here. The Wabash was very important that way. So, um, what ended the importance of the Wabash River as the pathway into Indiana and the initial effective settlement, the permanent settlement. When we talk about effective settlements in geography, those are the settlements that survived and remained. They're effective settlements. When we say other types of uh, temporary settlements, people often formed communities, but they didn't last. They died out, they vanished. We all know about Roanoke Colony, right? Uh, 1587 in the Outer Banks and then uh, they vanished. We didn't know what happened to them. There was another early colony like that in Maine. We never hear about that one though, but they, they didn't make it either. They didn't make it either, these people. They, uh, it was pretty cold weather up there in Maine and pretty poor farmland on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I'd say not good choices, but those are not permanent settlements. Effective permanent settlements though, were here in the Wabash Valley, okay, by the 1820s. Okay, at this time. What ended the role of the Wabash River, though, was the building of roads. A couple things happened. Okay, well, the National Road, everybody knows, right? The National Road, I don't know if there's a program on that coming up, but I hope so, because the National Road's pretty important in Indiana history. It was the first federally funded road across Indiana. It went from Richmond to Terre Haute, two colleges at either end of it, Earlham College and Rose Hallman. Yes. Is in Virginia? In Virginia? Oh, oh, Indiana, Richmond, Indiana. Yeah. Okay, well that's that that's a bigger place. That's the capital of Virginia, yeah. Oh no. That was the capital of uh, the Confederacy for a while, Richmond, Virginia. But Richmond, Indiana is on the eastern gate of uh, the state over here. If you if you take seventy, if you take seventy across the state, you'll get there. Okay, seventy sort of took up a lot of the old national road, but it's really US forty. Although we've renumbered parts of Terre Haute sort of crazy with US 40 and 46. I don't know why we did that. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask some politician about that. Um, but that's sort of funny. But the National Road, it took a long time to build that. It wasn't such an easy thing, but it's the first federally funded highway. It went from, did it go from Baltimore or Washington? I'm trying to remember. Baltimore, I thought Baltimore. And it ends at St. Louis, or Vandalia. Vandalia. It ends at Vandalia. And this road, if you want to read a good book on it, there's a book by a professor named Carl Rates. And Carl Rates wrote a wonderful book on the National Road, on its history, on its culture, on how it opened up this part of the country to settlement. Uh, Carl Rates was one of my professors at the University of Kentucky. This is a wonderful volume. I just uh, gave my copy away. I'm cleaning out my office every day and I, I take a book off the shelf. I don't want to have to do it all at the end of the year. So every day at least one book has to go. And I, I just took the National Road off and gave it to Professor Martland, my colleague who's a historian at Rose Hallman. So he has that book. But the National Road, Buffalo Trace, uh, other, uh, other smaller paths. Um, oh, Wayne's Trace was another one up north that was... Uh, where the military moved through. A lot of military roads in the north, northern part of the Northwest Territory were started because that's where the action was in the early years to claim and settle this land more in the north towards uh, Detroit and that part of the world. But anyways, uh, there's something else, two other factors that ended the importance of the Wabash as a transportation uh, method to settle here. Well, I mentioned the, the building of roads, but there are also the canals. And the canals were short-lived, but they were important. Connecting the rivers, connecting towns, and connecting to the Erie Canal down here. That was an important, but short-lived era. 1830s, 1840s, the canals. 1847, though, something happened that would change everything. Railroads. railroads. The first railroad, from what I can find, was built in Madison, Indiana, from Madison up to Indianapolis, the new capital of Indiana. 
Um, we wanted a central capital. Lots of states did that. You know, lots of states created a central capital instead of one that was in the southern part of the state where people settled. The old capital of Ohio was what before Columbus? Chillicothe. Chillicothe, Ohio. And that's uh, in the southern part of the state where the first settlers were. Okay, then they wanted a centralized place, Columbus. New city, name it after Columbus. Indianapolis, very similar idea right there. Let's find a central location and form a new state capital that's accessible to everybody instead of being on the edge or being in an area that's lower in population, okay? Um, what's the least accessible state capital? Any guesses on that one of all the state capitals today? Juneau? Mm -hmm. Juneau, Alaska, they want to move it. They, a lot, there's been a lot of talk about moving the capital to Anchorage or Fairbanks because Juneau is really inaccessible. It's not a good location for a capital. Juneau, Alaska. But if we look at our state capitals, a lot are new towns that were formed in the center of the state because of settlement patterns and because as the state got bigger, one of the things of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was how to establish new states, the rules about that. How many people have to live in a specific territory? When do we go from having a territorial government to having a state government? That was all spelled out in the Northwest Ordinance. So that was another important factor because the rest of the United States was based on that state building. So that was pretty important. Um, we move these capitals to the cities. We build rail, I mean, to the centers. We build railways starting in the late 1840s. They really took off the railway system just after the Civil War. 1866, 68, 1870s, we had railways, steam locomotives that reached almost the top speed they would run at for the next 50 years. They could go 60 miles an hour on good tracks. The key was having the good tracks, enough uh, straight enough tracks. And, uh, and Indiana it was filled with all kinds of bridges and trestles, some of the most amazing ones ever built. Um, they're still standing, a lot of them too. But the railroad, that was the way to get here now. And so other cities started to grow in other parts of Indiana rather than just along the Wabash River not just the Wabash River cities, but at places like Fort Wayne and places where the railroads ran between New York and Chicago. And so then we have the Northern settlement going on in large numbers and we have industrialization because industrialization is really important to have railroads nearby, to ship goods in, to bring in natural resources, raw resources for industry. So a lot of the heavy industry, a lot of the other, uh, you know, when we go from Gary, Indiana over to Fort Wayne, this is where we have industrialization in Indiana and the railroads had a lot to do with that. Indiana, of course, is almost also famous for building locomotives. We built locomotives here. Uh, anyone guess which school is sort of connected to that? How about the boiler makers? Yeah, how about Purdue? Yeah, that's, uh, there's a connection right there to, to building boilers for locomotives and, and a lot of, um, oh, what were they called? The old uh, steam, steam farm engines, steam traction engines. There was still one in my hometown and we used to go see it whenever old Mr. Krantz fired it up. Yeah. My grandfather would take me over there and, Lumen Krantz had a steam locomotive thresher machine yet when I was a little kid. And that was the craziest thing I ever saw in my life. I still remember that. Um, but a lot of those were built in Indiana. And I say that because I still remember as a kid looking at that steam locomotive uh, on the front of it, on the boiler, it said Marion, Indiana. And I still remember that. And anyways, so the Wabash was a very important gateway to settlement of early Indiana. Up the Ohio, down the Ohio, up the Mississippi, in some cases, to the Ohio. That was a tougher route to go. But you all know about Lincoln when he lived here in Indiana, too. He worked on a flat boat that all, went all the way down to New Orleans. And he wrote about that and how difficult that trip was and how treacherous it was with all kinds of uh, lowlifes attacking people. Another big part of American culture came from around here too, maybe a little further than the Wabash, but Mark Twain's first big selling book, Life on the Mississippi. And if you read Life on the Mississippi, you'll learn a lot about this part of the country. 
Uh, you'll learn about the Wabash area, you'll learn about the Ohio, you'll learn about the Mississippi, not too far away from here. Okay, so Life on the Mississippi, that's a pretty good book. Um, which railroads came through Indiana? All of them. All of them. <laughs> exactly, they did, because if you were going from the east to the west, you went through Indiana. Same with Ohio. Lots of railroads came through, except we had one other thing. We had Chicago developing up north. And so all the stuff from the north, and the biggest city in the Old South was what? New Orleans for a long time. New Orleans was our big port. Still is a port city, but it was the biggest city in the south for a long time. I believe Atlanta and probably Jacksonville or even Miami are bigger today. But uh, for a lot of the 19th century, New Orleans was the big city. And so goods north and south went to New Orleans. Chicago is not such a big place. Chicago was sort of late coming as far as cities. It was pretty late in, it, in its development right there. So anyways, the Wabash is very important. Settlement of Indiana, the opening up of the Northwest Territory in this part of the world. This whole region was called Terre Haute, not just the town here. But if we go back to the 1680s, 1690s and read about explorers, they talked about this whole area um, 100 miles north and south referred to the land as Terre Haute, I'm finding, in my research, which is sort of interesting. I didn't realize that, but uh, it was the high ground here that didn't flood on this side, on that side. We're, we're over on the low side here. We're on the side that floods over here, um, and that was the high ground over there. So, I mean, it still does. It still does. But eh, I think the history of rivers in the Midwest and in the Northwest Territory is very important in the opening up, the advancement of American ideals into the New West, the advancement of American culture into the Northwest. This is the Northwest I'm talking about, you know, to be clear on that, the Northwest Territory right here. Uh, and then it spread from here to the Great Plains and a lot of Hoosiers that were here. Do we even know the origin of the term Hoosier? I've read about three or four different ones. I don't know which one to believe. Which one's real? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I know that back in Ohio they say Buckeyes, and uh, that's confusing because it refers also to the people from Ohio State, <laughs> as well as supposedly all the rest of us in Ohio, but uh, I don't agree with that one too much. <laughs> um, I'm a Bobcat from uh, Ohio University. There were a lot of bab Bobcats here, actually, in this part of the country. You know, when I read about the New England and and Kentucky and Virginia settlers that came up the Wabash, um, wildlife was really plentiful. They loved the catfish out of the rivers. They, there was no shortage of game for hunting. I read from the flatboats, they shot about 100 squirrels a day, just for fun, probably, because uh, there was much larger game to eat. Um, I think that's all really neat stuff. I think that's pretty interesting. The people that settled here were really going in, not quite a wilderness. I mean, some people say it was a wilderness. I wouldn't say it's a wilderness here. I mean, if you've been out to the Great Plains, <laughs> yeah, then I think that was a rougher challenge out in the Great Plains. You did have the native people that um, everyone had to deal with one way or another, or we dealt with them in a way too, you know, not always the best ways. Um, but it was not so much a wilderness here. It was a place of great forests and woodlands and great plentiful game, good agricultural land, some of it had to be cleared, wonderful rivers for transportation, and good weather for growing crops and building your homes. So that's about what I have. I, I planned on spending about an hour, so I hope I uh, brought up some ideas to you and shared a little bit of my knowledge of uh, settlement of the Northwest Territory and the role of the Wabash River a little bit in Indiana. So thanks for listening. If there's any questions. <laughs> any questions I can answer before I go home and fast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Is there a replacement for a geography professor at Rose? Boy, there's a good question. Uh, no. There should be. There should be, and I've uh, I've talked to people about it, but you know, COVID has uh, hurt our budget a bit, 
And they said maybe in two or three years they'll hire a replacement, but not right now. But they also couldn't guarantee it'd be a geographer. So I said, well, I'll be gone, but it's up to you guys what you do, but I would really like to see geography continue at Rose Hallman. The reason I brought up the question is, as I interviewed Rose Grants oh, 50 years ago and over a few years, who really made it in time, the one course that they talked about more than any other was economic geography with John Locks and taught it from the mid 30s yeah. until 1960 when he became the development chief. Yeah, blocks him. I've seen his picture on the wall. And uh, his, his, I think his son-in-law was the register when I started there. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, Lou, Lou Harmony. Yes. Yeah, Lou's still around. He still plays golf and keeps active, I guess. Um, but yeah, geography, economic geography, <clears throat> excuse me, economic geography, I think that's always been an important course wherever it's taught. And we do have economics, but, you know, we have to keep geography going there, too. I hope they hire another geographer. Um, I was the first full-time geographer hired at Rose Hallman. Um, we hadn't had one before I came there. So I hope it doesn't end with me. I hope we have some more geography profs. Now, ISU is a good geography department. Uh, it's a big department. It has a doctoral program at ISU. <clears throat> I knew some of the people there when I started here. I've lost track of some of them that have retired. But uh, ISU is a good geography department. And uh, of course, down in Bloomington, there's a big geography department. So there are people to hire out of these programs for Rose Hallman. And I hope Rose Hallman does that because our students work all over the world. Our students work for companies that are international and global now. And I get more and more emails and postcards from alumni who tell me that, oh, I learned so much about where I'm at from your geography classes. I got a postcard from the Congo in Africa of one of our alumnus who's working on building an airport in the northern Congo. And he was in my Geography of Africa course. And I was just so impressed that he was in a difficult part of the world working for the government there and working on building an airfield. Um, so today work for engineers and scientists is so global, so international, I, I think geography is pretty important to understand a little bit more about the earth. Well, thank you everybody for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. It's pretty nice outside. And um, maybe I'll see you again at other talks this week or next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.